For the last several months, I've been reading my way through a lot of Horus Heresy books, the novels that act as an in-depth prequel and backstory to the Warhammer 40,000 universe. A lot of the action takes place in the ruins of thriving utopian cities, whether it's the teeming metropolises of the Ultramine world of Kalth or the Coral City of Istvan III. Reading these books, it feels like a recurring theme is the contrast of the horror and chaos of war taking place over the crumbling remains of the peak of imperial civilization. I wanted to create some of this feeling for my own tables. Now, in our modern cities, many of the grandest buildings have a neoclassical influence, with epic facades that echo the timeless architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. The grand columns, wide staircases, and titanic scale are something that I think would add a really cool dynamic to an urban war zone. So a logical place for me to start is with some nice columns. At a bakery supply store, I found these beautiful Grecian pillars that are normally used for decorating wedding cakes, and they happen to be the perfect size for what I have in mind. Now apparently these columns are being discontinued by the biggest manufacturer, Wilton, so they might be harder to get in coming years. If you want to get yourself some columns like these or any of the other materials I'm going to use in this project, I'll put some links to buy them in the description box below. As usual, I like to have a miniature on hand when I'm building something, as it helps me make sure everything is looking right at each step. It's also just fun. Pew, pew, pew. Now once I've figured out the relative spacing for the columns, I build a facade from pieces of insulation foam. Rather than trying to cut windows and a doorway out of foam, I break the foam down into smaller geometric shapes, and this gives you some nice crisp edges. Now I thought it'd be cool if these columns were raised up above the street level, so I used some 2 inch insulation foam for that. Of course, there needs to be a way to get up there, so let's add some stairs. Nice. Now as you may have noticed, I left the landing halfway up where a miniature can stand to make it more playable. Next, I want to add some areas next to the stairs where minis can shoot from a raised vantage point. This will have the added benefit of protecting the corners of the stairs and making the building a more interesting shape. By the way, behind all the movie magic, I've been gluing these pieces together with Gorilla Glue construction adhesive, which forms a strong bond with foam. Lots of glues will either melt foam or never dry in between the non-porous layers, so do the job right and use Gorilla Glue. <laughs> in classical architecture, the lintel that rests on top of the columns is called an architrave. It forms the lowest part of the entablature, which is the superstructure of moldings and bands that sits above the columns. We'll add some details to that later, but for now, plain foam blocks will form the basic shapes. Because I want the structure to be ruined, I mark out the shape on the back of it that will be destroyed. Now I had in mind that there would be a series of craters from massive bombs that have brought most of the building down but left the facade largely intact. I use a handheld hot wire cutter to carve away a nice sloping back and even add another piece of foam to get more of a slope. It looks really rough right now, but it won't matter because this will be all covered up. Now another trick for gluing foam together securely is to use some sharpened toothpicks to provide some internal structure, much the same way rebar works in concrete. This will make the piece much better at resisting shearing forces and have the added benefit of keeping it from sliding out of place as the glue dries. When you're building something like this, keep an eye out for useful shapes of scrap foam offcuts. Look at this piece I found in the trash for example. It fits perfectly as the ruined right side of the facade. What are the chances? To make the roof, I use a sheet of foam core board and simply trace the outline with a pencil. This is not especially precise, but that's the consolation of making something that's half ruined. You can plausibly blame all your mistakes on the fact that the foundation likely shifted during whatever it is that ruined it. In this case, maybe a massive bomb or something? Nothing's totally straight after enduring a massive bomb. So I cut that piece to size with an X-Acto blade, making room for a 1 inch foam parapet. I like my barriers and obstacles to be one inch high as a fairly consistent thing across my builds. It's the right height for a human to fire a rifle over. Now if you need someone taller behind it, you can always place them on a crate to boost them up. I make a ragged ruined edge to the roof with some wiggly blade work, and then I break that away. So let's take a break from the roof for now and work on the ruined section in the back. I start by using a thick cocktail skewer to reinforce a 1.5 inch column. This will support the ceiling, much the same way my awesome patrons support the channel. Huge thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. If you too are a person of impeccable taste and unrivaled magnanimity who's always wanted to be a patron of the arts, why not come join us today? You get access to the Discord community where we share stuff we're working on and bounce ideas off each other, and it's a huge help to the channel. Anyways, now it was really important to me to make this whole piece accessible to models rather than just a big dead zone in the middle of the table. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a route to the top of the piece made out of collapsed concrete. I start with a bunch of rough slabs stacked up in a sort of crude staircase with some precariously leaning chunks. 
It doesn't have to look safe at all. That's fine. And speaking of unsafe, I'm going to balance this broken slab of concrete on top of a leaning concrete pillar. To make this a little bit more plausible, I'm going to add some short lengths of wire to the middle of the slab to look like rebar. I reinforced this horrible little staircase with some more toothpicks and skewers. Nice. Let's get back to that roof. Time to make that entablature really sing. Now I found these lovely little bits of wood trim in the lumber aisle at my local Home Depot. The wood is pretty soft so I was able to cut these to length in this little miter box with nothing but a work knife. I'm going to start by adding one piece to the top of the entablature. This bit of trim is called the cornice. This will have the added benefit of protecting the vulnerable foam corners from bumps and dents. Next, I flip it upside down and use a different piece of trim to dress up the bottom of the freeze. This one I leave overhanging the edge of the foam by about a quarter inch. This way I can leave the roof removable and the overhang will hide the seam where it meets the architrave. Nice. Wait, what the hell? Come on. I'll have to fix that later. Anyways, for now, let's get ready to rubble. Get it? Oh, goddamn. Anyway. <laughs> I'm going to keep building up the enormous pile of debris on the back, starting with some large chunks of foam, dropping them in wherever I think they'd look good. Some of the more precarious pieces get pinned with cocktail sticks. Here and there, I'll lean pieces against each other to make little areas that are taller than a mini that would be good cover, and I intentionally leave large unobstructed areas as well. These longer broken column bits will make the overall shape and silhouette much more interesting and give everything a dangerous, unstable look. I made another precarious looking stack of pieces to act as a second route to climbing to the top, making sure to leave all sorts of pathways and flat areas for my little dudes to explore. So looking at the references of collapsed and bombed out buildings, I found that you often get this layered look in the rubble where concrete floors collapse down on top of each other like a layer cake. So to simulate some of these flat slabs of concrete that have collapsed down, I cut a sheet of foam core into a bunch of random shapes. This foam core that I bought off Amazon is unusual. It has a plastic sheeting over it instead of paper, but when you bend and distress it, the creases in the plastic film look a bit like spider webbing and cracks in concrete. So that's pretty convenient. Again, I'll put a link to this specific foam core in the description box below. So I glue these bad boys to the rubble pile, trying to overlap the higher ones above the ones below. This has the added benefit of creating even more terrace-like areas that the miniatures can stand on without tipping over. In some places, I prop them up with more bits of pink foam rubble. I also add smaller chunks of rubble to the cracks and corners for some extra detail. Damn, this is looking really cool. Let's work on the front a little more. I spiced up these side areas by adding a parapet. Again, that magical one inch tall height that I like so much. I sanded the edges smooth, then added some extra relief detail with chipboard which is essentially the thick card that you find at the back of a legal pad. You can imagine before the war struck, politicians and high officials could have sipped refreshments on these balconies during galas and balls and other functions. Now, they offer a vantage point for soldiers to fire in the streets below. Once again, this extra cladding not only adds detail, but it provides some protection to the vulnerable foam corners. I use more strips of chipboard to add some coping to the parapet. All right. Damn, this thing's looking pretty wild so far. It's going to be really cool to play some games on this. There's just one problem though. It's gigantic. Now luckily, I have a lot of storage space where I live right now. But if you wanted to build a big grand piece like this and don't have a lot of storage, you could compensate by having the rest of your terrain be very compact and easy to store. Now one such solution that I could recommend to you guys is this new set of hypermodular ruins from the sponsor of today's video, Snot Goblin Gaming. Snot Goblin Gaming set out to make something akin to LEGO for Wargames terrain that can be arranged into a ton of different interesting layouts, but also disassembled and collapsed into a small shoebox. So if you have a small living space, or are traveling, or just want to keep things compact, you can still have a full table of terrain to play on at your fingertips. This project is live on Kickstarter right now, until September 4th. I'll put a link in the description box below for the Kickstarter, so you can open that in another tab right now, and after the video, go check it out. So as you can see, they sent me a set, and I'm pretty impressed with the ingenuity of how they go together, and it's really going to integrate well with what I'm building today. If you go for one of the higher pledge tiers, you'll have plenty of pieces and vertical connectors to make some really tall, awesome skyscraper type buildings. So stay tuned until the end of the video to see what I do with mine. Again guys, the Kickstarter is live now, so go check that out. I think it's a really clever product that a lot of you are going to dig. Thanks, Snot Goblin. Now let's get back to this build. Okay guys, it's time to hide all these component parts under a coat of gesso. 
Now, gesso is a liquid plaster that's going to seal all the foam surfaces, adding durability and giving everything a nice toothy matte finish. Now, I love the stage in any build where the crazy colors of the component parts are all unified together, and a bunch of card and foam starts to look like a real building. I apply the gesso all over the structure with a cheap bristle brush, watching carefully to make sure no bristles come off and stick to the structure. I'm also watching for really obvious brush strokes. Gesso is thick enough that when it dries, there will be visible brush strokes if you let it dry that way. On some of the big flat areas, I stab the brush directly onto the surface to leave a modeled texture rather than directional brush strokes. After the gesso was applied, it really made some of the gaps and cracks in the build stand out, so I took a moment to mix up some two-part epoxy sculpt putty to fill those cracks. This clay dries super hard and it's very durable, so I'll get some great protection on these corners when it dries as well. If you've ever worked with a two-part epoxy putty, you'll know that one of the challenges is mixing up way too much putty and feeling guilty about the waste. I'm going to show you some ideas for how to use any extra clay that you mixed up. First, I'm going to roll some putty into a long rope and cut it into pillow shapes with a plastic knife. If I stack these up, bam, nice simple barricade of sandbags. Here's another one I like to do. I press the putty into an interesting shape, then press a piece of coarse bark into it from all sides. This gives it a nice rough rocky texture, and when it dries, I can use it as a piece of decoration on the base of a large model like a dreadnought. Anyways, with the gesso applied, I'm going to start going around and adding sand and rocks. If I'd applied these before the gesso, the brush would have picked up the loose grains of sand and deposited them on the smooth surfaces halfway up the walls and things, which would have looked unrealistic. So I do it in this order instead. Dump it. Nice. With the sand and stones down, I start painting the piece grey using grey primer and my airbrush. I'm pretty new to airbrushing and have never painted something this large with it before, and it was taking forever. So I went outside and hit the piece with some rattle can spray paint instead. I did a grey base coat and hit all the raised areas with white, mostly from an above angle. This will add some nice variation in shadows. I also hit it with some gloss varnish to prepare for the next step. Back inside, it's time to weather and dirty this piece up and make it look nice and realistic. I start by mixing some mineral spirits with brown, blue, and white oil paint to make a dirty grey oil wash. I apply this generously to the whole piece, leaving some nice vertical streaky effects with a few careful brush strokes. On the rubble, you can see how this wash seeps into the cracks on the foam core, making that detail pop a little bit. Oil washes are awesome because you can remove some of the wash if you like with just a bit of mineral spirits on a brush or makeup sponge, allowing you to really control the look you want. I thought about putting something on the entablature like a word or symbol like an aquila or something, but I decided against it because it keeps the building more setting agnostic. Maybe this is a non-compliant world that the Great Crusade is just now arriving to. Maybe it's a palace or a museum or city hall. By not putting anything to distinguish it, I don't have to decide now. I could even use it in contemporary games like Marvel Crisis Protocol or something like that. Similarly, I thought about making some window frames to put in the windows, but decided that the shock of the building collapse would have done away with those and it makes it much more playable if the windows are clear. I applied the same oil wash to the Snot Goblin Ruins I talked about earlier, because check this out. Boom. By putting another ruin on top of this building, you get a ruined skyscraper. This is the type of truly massive centerpiece that really sells the feeling of war in a once glorious city. There's enough rubble on the lower level to plausibly be a collapsed skyscraper as well. Overall, I think it looks fantastic. Let me know what you guys think. Would you have done something differently? Does it give you ideas to try something of your own? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time. Eric's Hobby Workshop.